and so we were arrested as being South African spies, which was very, very scary. Um, neither me nor my, my wife had the had Portuguese, and they were they were convinced we were, we were South African spies. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Good evening. The stunning overthrow of Mikhail Gorbachev by communist hardliners dominates the news this Monday. Gorbachev was reported under house arrest as Soviet tanks took up positions throughout Moscow. Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic. In this episode, we speak to John Green. John Green grew up in Coventry. And in 1964, he made the adventurous move to the German Democratic Republic to study film at the National Film School in Babelsberg, near Potsdam. He was the sole British student in the country. Returning to his native Britain in 1968, he became television correspondent for the GDR and spent 22 years reporting from around the world. Before we start, I'd like to thank our latest Patreons, including Clive Watling, Michael Robert, and Tom Williams. Patreons are supporters of the podcast who donate monthly and get access to some exclusive extras. And every donation keeps us broadcasting and expanding the show. Just go to our website at coldwarconversations.com and click on the Support the Podcast menu option. Now, back to today's episode. We start with John telling us about his early life in Coventry. John, welcome to Cold War Conversations. Thank you. Delighted to uh, have you on. I've, um, well, I'd been meaning to read the book for some time, and then when I got in contact with you, I had the impetus to uh, to, uh, read it in full. And a fascinating story um, it is, which I'm sure our listeners will be interested in. One of the, the, the first questions that I had is, can you just tell me about your, your early life and, and family? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I grew up in Coventry um, on a working class housing estate. And both my parents were, were communists. So I grew up in a communist family. My father was blacklisted in the engineering industry. And my mother also lost her job because of her convictions and then became a teacher. Um, but I went to school in Coventry and um, became fascinated with film. Um, by going to the local Continental Flea Pit Cinema, which showed all the Italian classics, French classics, and Russian films. Um, so I was I was interested in film from an early age. Um, but obviously, through my parents, I was also interested in politics, although I didn't become active in politics until I went to university um, when I was 19. Right. So you're a big fan of Eisenstein and uh, oh, absolutely, all of those. Yes, of course, the greats, yes. But, yeah. But particularly the Italian neo-realists as well. Oh, okay. Those, you know. Um, not that familiar with those, so uh, not my specialist subject. You weren't politically active yourself when you were younger, but then you became more politically active. Yes, because my, particularly my mother, but because my parents were active, basically I, I found it they, they took uh, my parents away from me because they were always at meetings, talking politics, and I preferred, I wanted them to be more concerned with, with my interests and what I was what I was doing. But so so that put me off politics to a certain extent, although I, I couldn't obviously avoid the atmosphere. Um, I mean I discussed with my school friends at, at school and so that I did that. And and how were your school friends with you know the fact that your parents were communists or were a lot of your schoolmates parents of the same persuasion as well? No not at all. We we were obviously there weren't many communists in Coventry. Um and um, you were always seen, probably people viewed you a bit with suspicion in the family, although we never felt any ostracism or anything, despite the height of the Cold War. Mm. Um, but, um, I mean, I know my mother, when she started teaching at a secondary modern school, the headmaster, uh, the headmistress um, had all the teachers in before she started and said, we've got to be careful because a communist is going to be teaching here. 
So make sure she doesn't influence you or influence the children. So they were warm, but but they were all very friendly and she never had any problem. Yeah, yeah. And obviously we, we've just talked about your interest in, in film. So when you let, what age did you leave school? 19. Okay. And then you wanted to study film and photography? No, it was in those in those days, you know, you, well, it's still largely like that today, I suppose, but you had to choose science or, or the arts. And because I was interested in bird watching as well, I stupidly chose science. So I went to university at Bristol and studied zoology, uh, but then became very disillusioned. And then in my third year, I transferred from zoology to drama and film. Um, so that's when I really took it up as a as a serious okay undertaking. Okay, and then why why did you decide to study that further in in the GDR and not in the in the UK or or somewhere else? Well, in those days, I mean, I'm talking now 1960, there was no film school here in Britain. And the only two film schools I knew about was one in France and one in Poland. Um, and so I didn't know how to get into the industry. It was very difficult. It was a closed shop. I had no contacts. Um, and by chance, we had a visit from an East German uh, lady from a Ministry of Culture who visited my, my parents. And through that contact... My mother said, well, why don't you try and get into the German film school? Because I didn't, I thought German would be easier to learn than Polish, to be honest. So I so I, I applied to the, the GDR film school and, and was accepted. So. And did you know much German at that point? Or? Hardly anything. I mean, I'd had a year at school, but I hated German, to be honest. <laughs> I thought, I'm never going to use it, so why should I learn it? And um, so, no, I had to pick it up. Yeah. On the street, basically. But I guess you, you're just immersed in it completely there because th th I'm presuming there weren't very many English speakers in the GDR? Or That's absolutely true. I mean, that's the difference to, to, to West Germany. Um, so in terms of learning German, it was very good because I, I just had mm. to speak German. There was, there was mm. no option. Yeah, mm. So there was hardly anybody who spoke yeah. And can you talk me through your, your first trip? So when, when you first went into the, uh, the GDR? Well, the first trip was actually when I was 19 and I went with a friend from Coventry on a, a youth work camp where we worked in a big aluminium factory in Bitterfeld. Um, we'd work in the factory for two weeks and then we'd be given a week's holiday on the, on the Baltic coast. <clears throat> so that was my first experience. That was mm. before the, the wall went up. I was actually in Berlin the year before the wall went up. Um, but then, um, then it was what then? Four years later, when I went after I'd finished studying mm -hmm. um, at Bristol, then I went back for the, for the, to, to go to the... First of all, I worked in the documentary film studio in Berlin mm -hmm. before going to the film school. Right. <clears throat> okay. And do, when, when you crossed into Berlin that time, the, the wall was there. So did you go into Friedrichstrasse? Yes. Yes. Okay. And did you just find it, it felt very different now that the wall was there or was... Well, I didn't... <clears throat> It was difficult to say. It didn't feel different because of the war was there. Um, I mean, it was still a culture shock in many ways. Mm. I mean, you know, the West Germany, particularly West Berlin, was obviously much more affluent. Um, and then you had that total lack of advertising. So it was all, as people invariably describe it, grey and colourless. Um, but for me, it was just an exciting place to be. And I, you know, was determined to make the best of it and um, see if I could learn what I could. You know, when I was there, you felt the war yeah. had finished yesterday. I mean, as you say, there were bullet marks everywhere. There were there was a rubble still around. Trees mm. were growing out of buildings. And it was very grey. People didn't have any colour. Mm. You know, everybody was in dark suits or, or, or leather coats. Mm. Um, it was still very much a, a post-war, early post-war situation. Yeah, because this was late 60s, wasn't 64. it? 64. Yeah, 64. 64. Okay, and the, the film school, where was that located in Berlin? That was in Babelsberg, where the, <clears throat> the former big Nazi Ufa studios were. Um, and the film school was right on the border. It was actually in the border area, so you needed a special pass to, to go into the film school because it was actually on the border to, to West Berlin. Um, although there was a British mission also in Potsdam there, which was which was interesting, and an American mission. Oh, is this the uh, the military liaison yes, missions? Yes, yes, they were they were next door. Actually, um, what were your fellow students like at the um, film school? 
Well, we were we were mixed. It was I mean most of them were were from the GDR, but there was a, a quite a large group of foreign students who were basically being trained so that they could go back to their own countries and then film the realities there. They were from Latin America, Sudan, Mongolia, Africa, um, so pretty wide range of, of places. Right. And <clears throat> any other British students there? No, no. Okay. I think I was the only British student at the time in the whole of the GDR, funnily enough. Wow. I mean, some several came later, um, but uh, at that time I was, I was the only one. And was there any, like, paperwork or bureaucracy that you had to go through because you were English there or was it you were just accepted as being a you know not a regular citizen but obviously your party credentials you know sort of gave you uh I don't know a stamp of authenticity not that you know that that was required but well that was essential to get me in yeah but once I was there we were issued with with um ID cards which which were for foreigners but basically mm -hmm. then you could do what you want and go where you wanted we were there there were no restrictions placed on us yeah so. <clears throat> okay and the and the course what did that consist of how how did that work well it was very good i mean they had they had different sections you could you could do a camera course directing course producers um uh or as a as a as an editor, yeah, those were the, those were the different categories, and there was a, a big acting acting um, section as well. Um, so I I did the camera course, um, and that involved the scientific background of optics, chemicals, because of still film in those days mm -hmm. it was pre digital, obviously. Um, a lot of camera work. Uh, we could make had to make several films as part of the course. We had lectures on film history. And we were able to see quite a lot of interesting films, which which the normal public didn't didn't have access to. Some of the old Nazi films we we, we were shown, a lot of the old Russian classics, and some foreign films from America and Britain, which weren't necessarily bought by the by the government, but we were allowed to see them before they were sent back. Right. Okay. Okay. And. Um, in in your book, you you tell about meeting uh, Bertolt Brecht's wife yes. at one point. That must have been really interesting. Can you share anything there? Well, it was fascinating. I mean, I before I went to Germany, I knew very little about German culture, and certainly nothing about Bertolt Brecht. But we were making a film there, um, a documentary on his um, adaptation of Shakespeare's Coriolanus. Um, and that's where I, I met Helena Weigel, who was quite interesting to talk to me because she was she was an Anglophile and spoke spoke very good English. I wanted to know what I was doing there and how I liked it. And it was she was just a fascinating woman to talk to. But I mean, I was a little tongue tied. I was only a young student, and um, she was asking me more questions than I was asking her. I mean, today I wish I'd asked more, but um, but it was interesting just to see they the way they worked in the theatre. You know, the incredible rehearsal times they had and the way they worked on every little detail. I mean, I remember um, Eckhard Schall, who played Coriolanus, he had a cloak made of red leather and it had to be imported from Austria, the most beautiful red leather, because it had to fall in a particular way. You know, they weren't they weren't satisfied with just cheap, cheap junk or... Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, you don't imagine that sort of detail going into... A play really because no. it's you know you imagine it's more about the acting rather than the okay you know the costumes are important but that level of detail yes yes it was incredible i mean it was a privileged theater you know they, mm. they got a lot of subsidy from the state of course through brecht's name and helena weigel herself had lots of clout so they they could afford that sort of luxury yeah long rehearsal times etc wow <clears throat> I, I also read in the book about a uh, a demonstration you organised against the the Vietnam War, which was uh, an unauthorised demonstration. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure now what what I, what I wrote in the book, but I, I think I got my facts slightly wrong. It was it was actually organised against the American invasion of the Dominican Republic. Okay, um, and. I, with several other friends, including one of the German friends, it, it's amazing how it came about, but we decided to organize a demonstration outside the American mission. Um, and we got talking to a few soldiers from the NVA in the pub and persuaded them to lend us some lorries 
to take us to the mission. And we, we went there and we, we were absolutely adamant that there would be no violence or anything, but we just had a few posters and we stood in front of the, the mission and uh, started shouting slogans. And it was totally unauthorized. And um, But we never had any stick. In fact, the, the local FDJ organization, which was the Young Communists, mm. they were... They were uh, quite angry about it because they should have organized it themselves but they didn't and they wanted to know how we'd done it you know but um otherwise i say there were no repercussions but it must have been one of the first <laughs> demonstrations like that to have taken place in the GDR. yeah yeah no absolutely i guess there would have been some sensitivity about doing it in front of the mission as well because absolutely. i mean it was a an authorized um you know it's almost like diplomatic building you know so absolutely and it could have been a diplomatic incident i mean i'm sure um you know we would have never have got permission to do it and i don't know what the authorities thought or what i'm sure the americans complained about it because everybody would think it must be an official demonstration mm. because spontaneous demonstrations like that certainly at that time didn't really take place well not very often anyway <laughs> no absolutely absolutely i think one of the stories i i really in, enjoyed in the book is you you tell a story of a missing um uniform from some of the prop stores yes um can you just tell tell that story yes well i would i was making a, a short film as part of part of my course and it was about a young american soldier uh leaving his family behind to go to fight in vietnam and um to do it properly we need an american uniform and so we went to the the day for studios um and of course they've got enormous props costumes and everything and so we got this nice american uniform uh, which the, the young actor wore to give a sense of authenticity to it but then uh we were halfway through the film and then we we wanted to hire the uniform out again and we couldn't it wasn't wasn't available anymore we gathered that some bright spark who wanted to 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 um, escape to the West um, had actually taken the uniform and just marched through the, the checkpoint at Checkpoint Charlie and got to West Berlin. So that, that, that stymied the film rather. Yeah, because <laughs> as allied military personnel, you didn't have to show any ID. The uniform exactly. was enough. Exactly, you could just walk back and forth, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, one, one of the, the, the other things that I, I was interested in was um, your work on English for You because I've I've seen the later TV programs. I think they were done in the um, 80s. Um, there's some or 80s, 70s yeah. or 80s. There's some later ones. And the, the books, I mean, still stand up quite well for English teaching. Obviously, there's a political slant on them. But looking at the books, they're, they're really well constructed and they're, they're good way of sort of uh, getting an understanding of conversational English, but how how did you end up acting effectively on uh, English for You? Well, as I, as I said to you, there weren't many English people there, so even to, even to make this program was a big um, logistical problem for these Germans because where do you get your English speakers from? Um, and the two main actors, Peggy and Tom, they 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 were recruited in in Britain, um, but all the sort of extras and the small bit parts had to be taken either by Germans who spoke very good English, or by any English people in the country they could they could use. Um, and because I was at the film school and close to the film studios where the, where the series was made, I was given quite an opportunity to, to take various small parts in this series, which was great because it supplemented my, my, my grant because it was useful. They paid me 100, 100 marks a, a day. Um, and it was also good fun. And I think, as you say, I mean, obviously it had... Uh, it was done from a political viewpoint of 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 the government and um giving the communist party and, and the daily worker or the morning star um more prominence than it actually has in britain itself but at the same time as you say it was mainly to teach the children language and i think it did it quite well <clears throat> yeah no it it did i mean <clears throat> one of the uh, books i've got um there's basically doodling in it from whoever owned it before right. Um, and there's one section where it looks like they got really bored because they're just writing names of pop groups around the margin right, yes. and, and stuff like that. But it's a great, I, I love it because it sort of like just captures a, a, a little moment there of somebody's childhood. Yes. Well, ironically, I mean, most most East German youngsters learnt their English from 
listening to Radio Luxembourg. Yeah. Because they all did. The music was, was obviously for them more interesting, more exotic mm. um, than, than their own oompa oompa music. <laughs> um, and so, yes, I mean, that's how they picked up their English in the main. But. Yeah. Now, I, d I understand you, you featured in a film with John Pete. Did you know him at all or, or speak to him much? Yes, but not a lot. I didn't know him intimately, but I mean, he was obviously well known in in, uh, in East Germany because of his German Democratic report. And he was an excellent journalist, very, very upper class Englishman. And so, yes, I met him <clears throat> while we were making a film called um, Frozen Lightning about the development of the V2. Yeah, I managed to find a clip of it on YouTube, actually, mm -hmm. um, which was I managed to spot John P. I'm not sure whether I found you yet. Yes, in there. well, I'm only in there for, I think, a few seconds. But there were several of us was an American called Victor Grossman, who also took took part in the film. And um, Mark Dignam, who was a Shakespearean actor here, came across and did a small part. And several Americans, I can't remember the names now. But yes, and the the two <coughs> English people that were recruited in for English for you, I think you said Valerie or Peggy and and Tom and Tom. Did they were they just recruited in, or were they presumably they were sympathetic to the? They were both. They were both communists, yes. right? Uh, and they were young communists, and um, both of them actors, um, so that they had a professional background. Mm. Yeah. And how many other English people were there in, you know, in in the GDR like John and and like um, yourself? Well, most most of them were teachers um, at the various colleges, universities. Um, I would say there's prob there were probably about twenty or thirty at the most at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, John Pete was the exception because he was a journalist. But they also had, I think, one or two working for their um, press agency, ADN press agency. Um, one or two who'd married Germans and ended up there after the war. Um, but otherwise, the others were all mm. teachers. Mm. <clears throat> I, I particularly like the John Pete story where he writes his uh, defection yes. as a, <laughs> as a uh, his last news release for Reuters. Yes. yes. Um, as he as he crosses over. No, brilliant, brilliant. I, th I understand you met your wife over there as well. Yes, I did, yes. And was she a fellow student? Yes, yeah, she was in the acting department at the film school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so we decided to get married. And uh, in those days, again, looking back, it, sounds, it seems rather extraordinary, but we uh, we just went to the British Embassy in Prague and she swore on the Bible and um, was given British citizenship. It was as easy as that. Wow. And funny enough... Neither the East Germans or the Czechs seemed to check up on us or were curious or interrogated us or anything. I mean, yeah. I don't think that would have been possible later, but at that time it was. Yeah, wow. And so after four years training in the GDR, you return back to the UK. Had you visited the UK in between? or Yes, yes. I'd come back to see my family that still lived in Coventry. My father was still there. My brother was still here. Right. But, um... and, and how did your... Were your family pleased that you were working, you know, that you, you were studying in the GDR? And... Well, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. They, they they felt that was fine. I mean, my mother was pleased, obviously, because she had part of the family there as well. So Because mm. she, was, she was in Potsdam at the teacher training college there, so we were quite close to each other. Right. Okay. And so you come back to the UK. How, what do you do then? Are you, you're looking for film work in the UK. Yes, I mean, again, I was still pretty naive and I'd got no contacts at all in the film industry. Um, so I, I wrote to various television stations trying to find a job. And the only interview I got was with Granada Television in Manchester, who said to me, I think they were just interested to meet me, actually. But the guy said, well, we could we could give you a, a job as a sort of trainee cameraman, but um, we don't know whether you'd be interested in that. And I said, well, look, I've just been trained. I don't want to go through a training again. Um, but I had no responses from any other television companies or film companies. Um, and apart from the fact, as I think I mentioned earlier, the film industry at that time was a closed shop. If you mm. didn't have a union ticket, you couldn't get a job. And it was a sort of vicious circle. If you had a job, you'd get a ticket, but you couldn't get a job without having a ticket. Mm. Um, so in the end, I thought, well, I'll just ask the GDR if they're interested in having a reporter in, in Britain. Um, and at least then I can work that way. And, and that's actually what happened when they took up my offer. Okay, and how did they interview you for that for that role? 
Well, I, I, I was interviewed in Berlin, and mm. um, they asked me how I felt I could do it, and whether whether I'd be willing to do it, prepared to do it. Um, because the, I think they were very keen in one sense, because in that period before the early 70s, the GDR still wasn't recognized internationally as a state. Um, and so they couldn't easily send reporters anywhere. Mm. Um, they couldn't get visas to various countries. And of course, as a British citizen, I could travel anywhere without a problem. And so you were acting as a freelancer, effectively? Yes, um, uh, we were based here. We set up we set up our own company, basically, a British-based company, um, but working almost entirely for the GDR. Um, and to begin with, we were just doing news items, and then it went on to longer documentaries. <clears throat> and what sort of stories were you were you covering for them? They were, I mean, obviously being a reporter for the GDR, they were concerned about showing. Uh, the negative side of capitalism, mm. um, the problems with living in a capitalist society. Um, and so most of our coverage was about strikes. It was about social problems, housing, um, <clears throat> one or two cultural items, talking to various artists who were, who were progressive. We did several interviews with, with, um, pop singers or footballers who were going to play in international matches. Um, but mostly it was it was social social subject matter. Yeah, yeah. No, the, you you talk really interestingly about um, the film you made with the Kent Miners, Men of Kent. I think it's yes, it's called, right. and I've yet to find any fo- any footage of that. Yeah. I was looking to see because I, I can't find any documentary footage of 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 your work on online. That is anyway, but. It's interesting because obviously you've captured there like a, a community that's now disappeared. I mean, all of those mining communities have now disappeared. And and in fact, the one in Kent, a lot of people forgot about because, you know, it was thought South Wales and Yorkshire, you know, that, that's where yeah. all the mining um, was. But it was interesting you saying how welcomed you were into, you know, the miners' homes. And they were almost like an isolated population there from the from the rest of Kent. Yes, that's true. It was it was a bit of an anomaly in the middle of this beautiful countryside. You've got suddenly pits there, and um, uh, because it, it was a very rich coal seam there, very very good anthracite. And interestingly, you know, quite a number of the miners were were sent there from Yorkshire, from Wales, from Scotland, and, and quite a number of them were were rebels, were communists, um, were union activists. So it was a very militant mining area, despite being in a what would be a very middle class surroundings, but it was, as you say, a very isolated community. Um, they were almost looked upon in those days the same way as gypsies. They were sort of mm. incomers who were dirty, you know, um, and uh, you didn't have much to do with them. So they did live very much an isolated, an isolated life. Are any of your documentaries still existing, or yes, they are in the archives in the in the in the Brandenburg Radio archives. You can get hold of almost all of them i think but you have to pay unfortunately they're not free online yeah but, but you can get hold of them yeah yeah well no you've you've intrigued me i don't, because i i just want to see the the style of them and, and yes. just get a, a a taste of you know what what your work was like right so uh i'll have to uh dig dig those out right I'll, uh, okay yeah. we'll invest in uh having a look at having a look at some of those you also did some overseas stories, but before we go on to that, I mean it's technically overseas. I I guess you did some coverage in Northern Ireland as well. Being British or English in Northern Ireland with a camera was that problematical for you? No, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, one forgets that in those days journalists were still treated with a hell of a amount of respect, um, and you could move. You know, even in war zones and everything else, without too much danger. Um, whereas that's completely different today. I wouldn't like to be out in the field today as a cameraman, to be mm-hmm. honest. Um, but um, even both sides in Northern Ireland, the um, you know the Republicans and the Loyalist side, they were keen to get their views across. So they're happy to talk to to any reporters. And I mean, we weren't the only foreigners there. There were Dutch teams, there were mm-hmm. West German teams, and. Japanese teams but we did spend quite a lot of time over there 
made several films in, 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 in Northern Ireland, well, and in the Republic as well, but Northern Ireland particularly, mm. covering, covering the Troubles. Yeah. Now, I was interested in your, you, you talk about um, some of the work you did in London Dairy when, you know, it was still free dairy and mm-hmm. it was that, 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 that separate area. And I'd, although I'd sort of lived through those times, I'd sort of forgotten about that period when it sort of became this independent area to, to some degree until... Yes, I mean, it really was like it like a civil war, which, well, it was a civil war. And, um, I mean, in Belfast, you had, you know, you had your Catholic areas and your Protestant areas. And as as a member of one of those communities, you didn't cross that line. Mm. I mean, we as reporters could, but they, they lived, again, a bit like the Kent miners in many ways, totally isolated from mm. their fellow countrymen who just mm. happened to be a different religion. Mm. And, 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 and even the British Army was very reluctant to go into strong Republican areas. Because they knew they'd likely to be to be shot or harassed or stones thrown at them by the kids. Yeah. So you really felt you were in a war zone. Um, I mean, there were soldiers on the street everywhere with machine guns. There were armoured cars. I mean, we stayed in the um, in the main hotel in central Belfast, and on two occasions, I think there were bombs outside and all the windows were shattered. Mm. And we were lucky we didn't we weren't injured, but it was it was it was not a pleasant place to be in. No. But a, I guess a perfect illustration for GDR TV of the failures of capitalism with soldiers on the streets and, you know, it, it was the perfect imagery for... Uh... In many ways it was, absolutely. And I mean, I mean the GDR interpretation, well, a Marxist interpretation, I suppose, of the situation was that it was more a class struggle than a religious fight, that the religious um, conflict... Um, was just a fig leaf, if you like, for for the underlying class struggle because the, the Catholics were mainly from the poorer indigenous population, and 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 the Protestants one had had a privileged existence and came from the the old landowning class from Scotland and, and England. So I mean that's that's a little simplistic, but nevertheless mm. there the were those class connotations very much, um, which were overlaid by religion. Yeah. But yes, as you say, for the GDR, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it just showed what could happen even in a capitalist country, you know, that um, the problems uh, couldn't be solved peacefully. You you covered some other overseas stories, and some of our listeners might not be aware of the political situations in some of those countries at the time. Um, one of the ones you talk about is Greece, where at the time there was a military junta mm-hmm. um, running the country. How were you able to film in those circumstances or speak to people? Well, you had to be very careful. I mean, we were neither me nor my colleagues had had experience of working in uh, dictatorial situations like that. And so you you were pushing the boat out a bit and you had to be careful um, what you filmed, uh, what you could film, what you couldn't film. Um, And we were arrested once in Greece because inadvertently we were filming near an airport and they thought we were spies. Um, they released us eventually, but it was um, it could have easily got nasty. Um, but we we had to be cautious in what we did. We couldn't. Um, we didn't speak Greek. We didn't have a Greek Greek interpreter. Um, so um, it was limited what we could show um, about what was happening. But um, we managed to film, you know, the prisons where political prisons were held, and. One of the islands where 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 political prisoners were held as well, so we could show little things like that, but it wasn't wasn't easy. Mm. So were you pretending to be tourists? Yes, yeah, right. we pretended to be tourists, and we 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 filmed. I got covered in a blanket in the back of the hire car we used, and I shot through the blanket um, so they wouldn't see us filming. Um, and but we yeah we took a very small camera with us, so it didn't it wasn't obvious that we were. That were professional um, television people, right? So. And your sound equipment was just a cassette recorder, and a, it was, a, it was a, not a cassette recorder, but, but a tape tape recorder, but, tape, but, yeah. but, a, but a small one, yes. yeah, yeah, right. And you also went to Spain, which at the time was still under the Franco yes. uh, regime. How how was that? I I mean, I obviously have only visited Spain since then, but mm. was it still very repressive during that that time? Yes, I mean uh, it was. It was, you know, still you couldn't you couldn't openly criticize the government or express any sort of left wing politics. I mean, 
one of the key moments we were in Spain. We were in Barcelona, where the Catalans every, I think it was one Sunday in every month, they held a demonstration in the center of the town where they where they danced their traditional dance. Um, and it was and it was broken up by the police. They'd, they'd surround the square with, with, with armored vehicles and then the police would pour out and they with their truncheons and just charge the crowds who would then disappear into the side streets. Um, and we filmed that. And so just to show that was was no leeway as far as, you know, you couldn't express any nationalist or progressive sentiments mm. in that, publicly in that sense mm. at all. Must have been quite nervy leaving and knowing that you've got those films in your luggage. Absolutely, um, that was that was always a worry, um, and um, we 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 couldn't keep full notes just in case they were examined as well. So it all had to be done cryptically. And I know my 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 colleague usually sent them as letters home to his wife, all our film notes, so that so that they wouldn't be on us when we when we went over the border. Um, so yes. Um, so yeah. how how do you turn? cryptic film notes into a, a letter to your wife i'm just yes <laughs> intrigued <laughs> i i don't know how he how he did this but i mean i think the, the thing is if it was if it was found because it had no address and no name on it as such right oh okay it, so you didn't need to codify yeah. it in any oh way. okay so it was the notes yes but it was probably the... just with dear elsie at the top exactly. or something yes, yes. And... and that would unlikely to be opened yeah but obviously if we'd had it with us going through the oh, airport security chip yeah, but again, in those days, security checks were very, very limited. Mm. Um, in, in most countries, funnily enough, it was very lax in those days. There, there's a documentary series you talk about in your book called uh, "All Tag Investen," mm -hmm. and that seems to be of a different style to some of the other stuff that that you were doing. Yes, well, it was a new it was a new idea um, which which was developed by by the group we worked with in the GDR called called the Cartins Group. Um, and it was the idea of Altag Investen means every day in the West. And it was a series, two, two 25 minute films each month, uh, purporting to show what life was like in, in the West. Um, obviously, largely the negative side, mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, the conditions of working people and, to say, housing. Um, we did a film on, on Liverpool, for instance, which was loosely based on, on the Beatles, but showing all the, the social problems in Liverpool. Um, and it was quite a successful series because um, it was imitated afterwards by, by, by the West German, by the West German television. They tried to do a similar one on the East. Um, so because they felt this was, this was quite effective. And the way, I don't know whether I, I mentioned, I think I do in the book, um, because rather... Contrary to what one would expect, people in the GDR were uh, very well informed about what was happening in the West, mainly because they could watch West German television, but also because they didn't believe necessarily their own, the propaganda of their own government. Um, and so we worked by only using the original sound of the interviews we did. We didn't, we didn't have a, a commentator in shot telling people what was happening. So it all had to be done basically anonymously behind the camera. So we relied on the interviews we did to say what was happening so that it would be more believable for people mm. rather than saying, oh, well, you can say that because you're just spouting the government the government line. Mm. So it was essential to try and achieve some sort of authenticity. And that was a very different style to how documentaries were made almost everywhere in the world at the That's time. That's right. It was, it was very new because, I mean, even still today... Uh, it sometimes can get very annoying where you've got your reporter there. Okay, he's on the spot, but he's telling you what's mm. happening rather than letting people tell you. Um, but um, so in that sense, yes, it was a it was a different way of making documentaries. Yeah, mm. I was interested in your um, trips to Africa as well, particularly, and this is probably lesser known. Is, is you know, you, you talk about um, the doctors from the GDR working in Mozambique and, and, and places like that. And I was interested to hear about that because you, you often read about, um, you know, giving them training in intelligence and military side, but less on that medical side. Can you share anything about that? Yes, well, I think the GDR had uh, probably going back to, to the 
to the pre-war days in the 30s when uh, Germany had quite a strong tradition of international solidarity. Um, you know, the International Workers' Relief Organization was based in Germany in the interwar years, um, which um, campaigned and fought for Indian independence, Vietnamese independence. It helped the Irish during the famine. Um, it gave support to the strikers in Britain during the general strike. So there was that tradition of solidarity. And the GDR was, was well known probably more than any of the other countries apart from the Soviet Union maybe of, of offering genuine support to countries fighting for their liberation. And as you quite rightly say, it was very often military and, and, and security based, but also it's often overlooked. It was often, you know, they trained teachers, they sent doctors out as they did in Mozambique. Um, they built a hospital in Nicaragua. Um, they um, they trained uh, young Mozambicans in fishing techniques in the GDR. Agricultural experts were sent out. So there was that side of things as well. I mean, the GDR, obviously, as as any country, also um, gained advantage from this in the sense it, it, it facilitated trade. Mm. And they were often paid in, in, in kind by, by, by fish or agricultural products or what for the training they were giving. But so it was... It's, for both sides, it was advantageous. Mm. And also you were working with some of the uh, liberation organizations in, in those countries. So um, I was reading about the time in uh, Namibia and Angola, mm -hmm. um, and you, you described quite a – it sounds pretty scary when you cross into Angola mm -hmm. from Namibia and your contact doesn't turn up. Yes. And uh, can you just share a little bit of that story? Yes, that was that was a very one of the most scary moments in, that, in our film work, and probably down to naivety to a certain extent, because we were we'd hired a South African car and we travelled into Angola in a South African car, um, and there was still a civil war going on in, in in Angola, and particularly between the three different liberation movements. Um, and we were unable to meet our contact from Namibia on the Angolan side. And so we were arrested as being South African spies, which was very, very scary. Um, neither me nor my, my, my wife had, uh, had Portuguese. Um, so everything had to be translated. And they were, they were convinced we were, we were South African spies. Um, and they held us for about four days. Um, until luckily they were able to make contact with SWAPO, which was the Namibian Freedom uh, Organization in London, who who could uh, tell them we, we were genuine um, filmmakers and reporters from Britain and that we weren't spies. And that, that I think, saved our lives because there, there had been other journalists who'd been killed out there, um, that sort of suspicion. So, yeah, that was that was quite scary. Wow. Yeah. No, absolutely. Because um, some some of the other countries you, you covered, I, I found interesting as well. I mean, you were in Grenada. That was before the American invasion, was yes. it? When when they had the uh, the socialist government? There. Yes, yes. I mean, that was one of the rather than showing the negative side, it was a positive side um, that, that we went to Grenada after the New Dual Movement had, had, had taken power mm. there and had started trying to build a, a socialist society. Um, we did have a team. I wasn't uh, there, but my wife and, and another cameraman went out after the American invasion as well and made another film in Grenada. But when we were there, we were we were mainly just showing what what the country was trying to do. And also there again, the GDR was helping. It set up telephone infrastructure in the country. Uh, the Bul Bulgarians were helping them build a, a fruit canning factory. So the the communist world was was trying to help them build build a socialist society there. Mm. And it was just fascinating to see how you know, this small country, no one had expected in the British Caribbean to see yeah. a sort of Cuba-style country um, emerging. But that's what it was, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it for episode one with John Green. We have got a second episode which will be coming in the next few weeks. If you like the podcast, please leave reviews on iTunes or with your podcast provider. It really helps us get guests and increases our profile. 
If you're on Facebook, do join our discussion group where there's loads of Cold War information and further discussions with our guests and listeners just like you. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. If you're a Twitter fan, we're also there. Our handle is at Cold War Pod. Lastly, if you like what you're hearing, do share details of the podcast with your friends and on social media. Thank you very much for listening and supporting us. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.